Hi, I'm Sarah Maurer, and today we'll be talking about using water as an organizing force for living systems. To better understand how living systems are organized, we first have to understand the thermodynamics of aggregation behaviors. And to do this, we need to use the thermodynamic equation that the free energy, delta G, or the change in free energy, is equal to the change in enthalpy, delta H, minus the temperature in Kelvin, times the change in entropy, delta S. And we usually measure enthalpy in kilojoules, and entropy is measured in joules per Kelvin. And so in this, we have an enthalpic contribution to free energy and an entropic contribution to free energy, which will decide whether or not a reaction is going to proceed. So if the free energy, delta G, is negative, it's called exergonic, it releases energy, and it's favorable. Similarly, negative enthalpies are favorable, and those are called exothermic. And we can also have a favorable entropy. And a favorable, favorable entropy is an increase in entropy, so a positive entropy, which will contribute to a negative free energy using the modification of the entropic term, negative T delta S. And so having an unfavorable free energy or enthalpy is going to be a positive term, where a negative entropy is going to be a more ordered or a non-spontaneous process. Um, we use the terms favorable and spontaneous pretty interchangeably, although it may depend on your field. And if uh, free energy is equal to zero, that means that the reaction is at equilibrium and it won't proceed, but it also will not go in the reverse direction. So keeping that in mind, maybe we should talk a little bit more about what enthalpy and entropy really are. Enthalpy is usually in chemistry considered heat energy, hence the value delta H. And this is usually considered to be stored in bonds. So if we're going to pull two things apart, that's going to take energy, um, meaning we'll have to put in enthalpy, a positive delta H. And if we're going to put two bonds together, that's going to release energy, um, giving us a negative enthalpy or a favorable enthalpy. So making bonds is favorable, and generally breaking bonds is unfavorable. Entropy, on the other hand, can be defined in a lot of different ways. Some people say it's a measure of disorder in the universe. Some people say that uh, it is uh, a more chaotic state. And in chemistry, we usually say that entropy is kind of a measure of the number of possible states uh, and how those possible states are occupied. So for example, a molecule like dye that is dissolved in water can move freely around that water phase as we see in the figure. But if we add more water to our dye solution, that dye is constrained maybe to the bottom half of the uh, container. And then after some time, entropy will drive the dye to spread further out throughout the container. So this is an entropically driven process where it goes from an ordered system with the dye all on the bottom to a disordered system with the dye all on the top. But what really drives this is each dye molecule wants to occupy as many possible states as it possibly can in some amount of time. And so we get this diffusion process that is mediated by entropy. And the same thing is going to happen in our chemical systems uh, with either uh, because these systems are dissolved in water. So the enthalpic contribution from water is due to hydrogen bonds, which are not like covalent bonds that we see within molecular structures. They are considered intermolecular interactions. So they occur between molecules that are not covalently bonded. They're usually transient. Um, but they are very, very strong. And so when hydrogen bonds can only form because water is polar. So you can see in the picture that the oxygen is partially negative and that the hydrogens are partially positive. And that's because oxygen really likes to hold on to its electrons. And in fact, it sometimes steals some electrons from the hydrogens. And so the hydrogens end up being a little electron deficient and the oxygen ends up being a little electron heavy giving it that partial negative charge. So if you put two oxygen or two water molecules together, you end up with what's called a hydrogen bond, where the partial charge on the oxygen associates with the partial positive charge on the hydrogen of a, a different water molecule. And this association, this charge-charge association, is a rather strong bond or intermolecular force. And this can only happen when you have a molecule that can really hold on to its electrons. And so 
uh, nitrogen and fluorine are also very electronegative and can also form hydrogen bonds. This is really great because the main uh, atoms that form hydrogen bonds in biomolecules are going to be nitrogen containing molecules like the nucleobases or proteins and then water can interact with those very very strongly and you can see in this table that we have uh, water interacting with itself in the first example um, but you can also have water interacting with uh, C double bond O like in uh, protein the peptide bond or you can have a nitrogen hydrogen interacting with a water molecule or with itself in something like a peptide bond which we'll talk about later so water also has an entropic contribution, which is that water doesn't just hydrogen bond with a single water molecule. It actually hydrogen bonds with many water molecules. So a water in general can form about two to three hydrogen bonds per water molecule. And if you look at this over time, each water molecule will change its hydrogen bonding pro partner every second or, so, or less than every second. And so we get a lot of uh, possible conformations in bulk water phase where the hydrogen bonds are constantly changing their conformation. Water can also interact with other molecules like salt. So we know that when we put salt into water, it dissolves. And here in this figure, you can see that sodium chloride, sodium being the red ions and chloride being the larger blue ions, are getting dissolved through intermolecular forces where the water, the partially charged oxygen, is interacting with the sodium ion, the positively charged sodium ion, and the partially positive hydrogens are interacting with the negative chloride ion. And this bond is actually a little bit stronger than a water-water interaction, which allows the entropic contribution of water interacting with itself to be ignored and the enthalpic contribution of the bond forming between the sodium and the water uh, to be favored, giving this a favorable free energy. And in this case, we would say that water is really good at dissolving other molecules that are polar or charged molecules. And this gives us the term like dissolves like. Oil, on the other hand, does not dissolve in water. So here you can see a representative oil molecule, hexane, which is composed of carbon and hydrogens. And the carbon-hydrogen bond itself is not very polar. And with the hydrogens evenly distributed across the carbons, this gives the overall structure of hexane a complete nonpolar conformation. When water tries to interact with something that's nonpolar, it cannot form hydrogen bonds, which means that it forms this rigid structure that you see in the cartoon with an oil molecule, yellow, in the center, here is cholesterol, trapped within this geometrically constrained water structure, the blue and the red atoms. And so this is entropically unfavorable to keep oil in a water phase. What we call this is the hydrophobic effect, when entropically oil is forced out of a water phase. If you think about the dye water example, when we added more water to the dye solution, the dye diffused into both the water solution. And if you think about oil in the same way, why would oil not diffuse into a water solution? It's because when oil interacts with water, it decreases the entropy of the water and that is thermodynamically not unfavorable and so for water to have the highest possible entropy it forces the oil out of the water phase and this is called the hydrophobic effect it causes the aggregation of lipid membranes and so a lipid membrane serves as a hydrophobic barrier between the environment and the inside of the cell it can also serve to organize organelles within the cell, things like the nuclear membrane, separate the DNA inside of the nucleus from the cytosol, which can contain degrading or toxin uh, molecules. This also can serve to allow for Darwinian selection, where a single individual can outperform its peers within a population to survive and reproduce. The other way that water can organize our cells or our living systems is through protein folding. And so water is gonna to serve to organize proteins much in the same way that it serves to organize lipid membranes. It helps them aggregate into a globular folded structure which can be catalytic. 
So on the left-hand side, you can see the peptide backbone, which is an NCC repeat. And that NH bond is capable of forming hydrogen bonds, both with water, but also, and perhaps more importantly, with the C double bond O of the peptide backbone, which you can see in the second image. In the second image, there are these small dotted lines within the alpha helix structure and the beta sheet, which serve to enthalpically stabilize these secondary structures. This leads to the full tertiary structure, which is the third image on the right here, um, where the enthalpic contribution of hydrogen bonding can stabilize our secondary structures. It can also stabilize interactions between these secondary structures through hydrogen bonding and things like charge-charge interaction. There's also a entropic contribution, a favorable entropic contribution from water not having to interact with nonpolar residues like phenylalanine. And so if phenylalanine was sticking out into the water phase, then it would the water would have to form these really rigid clathrate structures around that phenylalanine. So instead, the protein aggregates so that the phenylalanine folds into the middle of the protein, um, which allows it to be more organized so that it can better catalyze reactions. Uh, one of the entropic contributions that is not favorable is that when a, pep when a protein is unfolded, it has a lot of possible conformations. And when you fold it up entropically, it really kind of has one conformation or maybe two conformations. And so entropically uh, folding or a folded conformation is a little disfavored. And so the question is, how, do, how are these uh, organization behaviors of water relevant to the origins of life? Are proteins necessary for first life? What about membranes? Well, even if we're talking about just the RNA world, where RNA can fold up into catalytic structures like proteins do, that folding would in part be driven by entropy as well. And so water would be necessary for those conditions. And really water is the only solvent that has this really high entropy, even ammonia, which could technically form hydrogen bonds between the NH bonds in itself, would not have that same entropy because the NH hydrogen bond is not as strong as the OH hydrogen bond. And so we wouldn't see the exact same thermodynamics with a different solvent system. So it's quite possible that water is the favored solvent for life here on Earth, but also elsewhere in the universe.